The only man that is mentioned to commit adultery in the Bible is David, who is a man of God and in right standing with God at the time of his death. And what he does is goes into Uriah's wife and takes her. In fact, he's told by the prophet there was a story of a man who had only one sheep and a rich man who had thousands of sheep and went and took the one sheep. Now we know then David is committing adultery against God first and then Uriah, Bathsheba's husband. He's not committing adultery against these other seven wives who are now coming to David and saying, we're going to divorce you now because you've went ahead and committed adultery against us. They probably told him that wasn't a wonderful thing that you did in going and taking another man's wife. But the adultery was against God and against the other man, Uriah, for taking his wife. Now we can begin to understand what the Lord is actually saying in the Gospels. Because without this knowledge being that the Gospel and the Old Testament are all, all the words of the Holy Spirit that is of the Lord Jesus, that is of the Word of God as we know in John 1. So when we go to Matthew 5, we can finally understand what the Lord says in verse 27 and 28. And he says in verse 27, You have heard that it was said by them of all time, You shall not commit adultery. And we have just seen the definition of adultery. Verse 28, But I say unto you that whosoever looks at a woman, so it must be a man, because the Lord will never tell us that a woman should look at a woman, to lust after her, not after a man, has committed adultery, Moikea, with her already in his heart. So, if this would not make sense if a, a single man would look at a woman who is a single woman. They couldn't be committing adultery. They'd be committing fornication, perhaps, or sexual immorality. But the Lord is using the word Moikea, which is adultery. That means the Lord is saying, do not look at a married woman because woman is ganaika in Greek, which means woman and means wife at the same time. Now we understand what the Lord is saying. He's saying, do not look at another man's wife. Do not desire another man's property. His wife is his property. Do not desire. Do not covet her. A married woman. Now, if you don't know if she's married, you're better off not lusting out of her any woman to begin with. But if you do know that she's married and you're lusting after her, you're committing adultery, meaning you're taking another man's wife. This is not just looking at any woman with desire. This could be sexual immorality, fornication. But the Lord is specifically saying, do not go and plan in your heart love or lust for another man's wife so that you will commit adultery to begin with, which means taking another man's wife because that's his possession. So now we can read in the book of Romans, Chapter 7, verse 2. For the woman which has a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he lives. But if the husband be dead, she's loose from the law of her husband. In verse 3. So then if while her husband lives, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. This is because we explain. The definition is that the husband purchases the wife, she becomes his property. Now, as a, as a own property, again in a spiritual way, first of all, but in a legal way as well. She cannot ask for divorce because she doesn't have the title, the deed, to say, I'm giving you a divorce since you are the owned party. You cannot petition for it to be unowned. The owner has to let you go in order for you to be divorced as a woman. This is clear because no woman, no woman at the time of the Lord Jesus in the Hebrew times ever could file for divorce. This is a recent satanic invention that was designed in the 1930s, 1937 and 1973 to give the rights to women to divorce their husbands. This is not in the Word of God. I'm not arguing whether this is good or bad for individuals. I'm just saying this is what the Word of God is saying and either we decide to read it and understand it for ourselves or we can fall into the satanic deception, which I will continue to explain where he's going to lead us. So now we'll see there is no contradiction with both the Matthew 19 verses of the Lord and the Mark 10 verses of the Lord when he talks about marriage and divorce. And it's two separate occasions when the Lord explains what, he's, what he thinks. So in Matthew 19 verses 9, he says, The Lord, and I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, 
and shall marry another commits adultery. And whosoever married her which is put away does commit adultery. So this is purely to a man that he's speaking, putting away his wife for reasons of fornication, which is porneia, not moikeia. Fornication means sexual immorality. So the Lord is saying, do not divorce your wife for any other reason other than she's sexually immoral, which could include the fact that she's an adulteress, meaning that she has affairs with other men, but it could be also any other sexual immorality. This is what Pornay is about. Except for that reason, do not divorce her. Because if you do, and she was not sexually immoral, then she will remarry and she will be an adulteress because she still belongs to you. Because that reason why you divorced her was not valid. So the only time in the Gospels that the Lord mentions a woman is in Mark, in verses 11 and 12. And it says, in verse 11, And he said unto them, The Lord, whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another, commits adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she commits adultery. Now, with the King James, which is the most accurate translation we can find, translates as put away, is actually a difference in the Greek. Because in verse 11, the husband putting away or divorcing the husband is the wife is apoluse, which is a present tense, meaning divorcing her. Whereas in verse 12, it's apolusasa, which is in a past tense, which means having divorced, meaning the wife having been divorced, having gone through a divorce. She has been divorced, whereas he is divorcing her. Because again, no Hebrew woman could ever file for divorce, which is why we need to carefully understand the text. The Lord is saying the same thing he just said in Matthew. Do not divorce your wife, except if she is sexually immoral. And as a wife, if you have been divorced, do not remarry. In both cases, will be committing adultery. But in the case of the man, the way in which he's committing adultery is that he's forcing adultery upon her. In fact, the verse says, verse 11, Mark 10, 11, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another commits adultery against her, which means... The verb, the, the Greek is a P, means he's forcing adultery onto the wife, not himself committing adultery, since he has the right to the wife, but he's forcing, committing, pushing a P upon, on top of her, the crown of adultery. This is exactly what the Greek translations mean. Then you can see all of the three Gospels, and finally, they will make sense. So now, finally, that we understand the proper structure, what the Lord is saying, what the, what the Lord God has told us in Leviticus, the structure is, now we can finally go to 1 Corinthians 7 and understand correctly what are we supposed to be doing in either cases. In 1 Corinthians 7, as the Holy Spirit through Paul addresses marriage, it's a very simple idea. It's either an unbelieving spouse or both or is believing spouses now this is a very critical distinction because by believing we are meant to understand it's not anyone who says they believe in god is those who are born again understand the word of god understand the truth and are being filled with the holy spirit this is a believer according to the word of god Somebody who says it believes in Christ and there's no spirit in them. There's no fruit. There's no abiding. There's no obedience. But they walked down the aisle and said that they believe in Christ one time. I don't think they're believers. So it's very important that we're very careful on understanding who is a believer, who is not a believer. But generally speaking, a born again Christian is a believer. Anybody else is not. So if there is an unbelieving spouse, or if you were an unbeliever, when you divorce, any divorce that happens during a time of both spouses being unbelieving is accounted okay. What does it say? 1 Corinthians 7 verse 15. But if the unbelieving spouse depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God has called us to peace. 
God has called us to peace only in the condition of an unbelieving spouse, which means if they're both unbelievers, Mormons, Catholics, Jehovah Witnesses, atheists, Mormons, anyone who is not a born-again Christian and dissolved a marriage, Paul is telling us, let them depart. This is the condition of peace that we're called to pay attention. Now, if there is a believing spouse, the spouse is supposed to stay. Let the unbelieving depart. So the spouse is not going to call for a divorce, whether uh, is a husband which who is entitled to call for a divorce, and certainly a wife who is not entitled to call for a divorce. They both will stay and let the unbelieving spouse depart on their own. This is the only way that the unbelieving can leave if they choose to file for divorce. In any other cases, the wife is called to stay and so is the husband. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 10 And unto the married I command, yet now I by the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. We just explained this. The wife is property of the husband. Paul saying, the Lord is commanding the wife to stay with the husband. He's talking about the believers. Now, in verse 11 it says, But if she departs, okay, a believing wife, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband put away his wife. If a wife who is a believer wants to separate for all reasons, could be abuse, a cheating spouse, all kinds of things, she's entitled to separate. But she cannot remarry. She cannot date. That will be fornication. She cannot see any other men. She still belongs to her husband. She just chooses to be in a separate place, in a separate home. The husband will not divorce her just because she moved out. Instead, they're going to work together to reconcile. I will continue to expand the teaching probably in a separate video. But for the time being, I want everybody to understand the primary point of this deception. Satan has a plan. The moment that he enables the woman, who is the weaker vessel, as we know from 1 Peter, to file for a divorce with all good reasons that come from the world, because she is more sensitive and because the husband perhaps is ignorant or does not know the truth or is not filled with the Holy Spirit or simply fell into sin, then the family will dissolve. She, not knowing the truth, will remarry and basically be dying in her sin unless she finds the truth and repents. The husband as well will die in his sins. This takes both souls to hell. So the children which witnessed the divorce, if that was a Christian home, will wonder where was God when the divorce was happening. This is a lie from Satan, of course, because God was there and telling them the truth. But because of that, they will depart from the faith and most likely, possibly, although God can do all things, as we know, also end up in hell. This is the perfect plan Satan has. Whereas once we understand the wife cannot file for divorce and the husband cannot divorce his wife for any other reason, unless she's sexually immoral or either of them are unbelievers and one of them wants to depart, for any other reasons, there is no divorce. Anything that happens in the couple is to be sought out with the Lord, the Holy Spirit, in forgiveness, in mercy, in understanding they need to be filled with the Holy Spirit in order to be married according to godly standards. Without that, it's not a Christian marriage. Without this, it's just a worldly decision. So please, go to the Word of God. Understand what, what the Lord is saying. Because the Lord has told me to share this with everyone, as well as many other truths about the gospel. Not just the end times. The end times are given to us through this ministry so that we know we have no time for me not to waste any more time and tell you the truth about what is happening because everybody has to clean their own homes to be in right standards, right good standing with God and be prepared for the times ahead. I hope this message was a blessing. I will leave the comments open. I hope you can be of use to others and I hope you can share any important questions. May the Lord bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.